So hush, little baby, don't, don't you cry. One of these mornings, you're gonna rise up singing. Thank you. And you'll spread your wings and take to the sky. Until that morning, there is nothing can harm you with daddy and mommy standing by. You might have noticed that there's a war against mothers and mothers who don't want to be mothers. To the mothers who are joyous, to the mothers who are glad, to the mothers who are pious, to the mothers who are sad, to the mothers in their 90s, to the mothers in their teens, to the mothers full of passion, to the mothers full of beans. To the mothers who sing with laughter, to the mothers who paint with joy, to the mothers happily ever after, to the mothers who annoy. To the mothers who care for mothers, to the mothers who care for dad, to the mothers who care for others, to the mothers who wish they had. To the mothers with no regrets, to the mothers who have a few, to the mothers with a heart of gold, to the mothers who have two. To the mothers with all the answers, to the mothers without a clue, to the mothers who are dancers, to the mothers who walk with you. To the mothers from every country, to the mothers from every tribe, to the mothers of every color, to the mothers who keep hope alive, to the mothers who stretch the dinner, to the mothers who sacrifice, to the mothers growing thinner, to the mothers without the rice, to the mothers who have plenty, to the mothers who have none, to the mothers who stay, stay at home, and to the mothers on the run, to the mothers who must cover, to the mothers without a face, to the mothers we can't see, to the mothers who leave no trace, to the mothers through the ages, to the mothers who were Eve, to the mothers who bore children, to the mothers who did not conceive, to the mothers with their daughter, to the mothers with their son, to the mothers who are serious, to the mothers who are fun, to the mothers who are sexy, to the mothers who have given up, to the mothers who are ditzy, to the mothers living it up, to the mothers who are in chemo, to the mothers in jail, to the mothers who are in rehab, to the mothers who had to bail, to the mothers crunching numbers, and I just lost a little piece here, so I'm sorry about that. Ah, uh, yes, well, to the mothers crutching numbers, to the mothers who let them slide, to the mothers who meander, to the mothers who guide, to the mothers who save the arbor, to the mothers who gave us birth, to the mothers, here we are now, to the mothers who save the earth. I will just get Technical dick. I hate when that shit happens. So the moms who rely on technology. Yeah, well. <laughs> right, right. Well, when you do it the old fashioned way, and you, you bring your shaker into the museum, the Metropolitan Museum, they wouldn't allow it. Okay, well, we're going to do something else now. 88 degrees of separation. There are 88 degrees of separation between me and that chinless hypocrite. 
Addison Mitchell McConnell Jr. 88 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature of the Warm Springs at Warm Springs, Georgia, a haven for prosperous Southerners seeking 88 degree waters. 32nd President Franklin Delano Roosevelt contracted polio in early 1920s. He visits Warm Springs, bathes in the 88 degree springs, soothing paralyzed legs, and President 32 buys the ramshackle Merriweather Inn, builds his little White House, founds a treatment center for polio, and starts the March of Dimes. In 1945, FDR dies at Warm Springs. Then in 2017, President 45 has an ally in Mitch McConnell, long-term senator from Kentucky. Born in Alabama in the early 40s, young Mitch contracts polio. At eight, moves to Georgia, gets treatment in Warm Springs. Overcomes polio, is not paralyzed. Early 1950s, polio epidemic skyrockets. Thousands and thousands contract polio deaths and there are paralysis. Sabin and Salk are in a race to prevent polio with vaccines. Baby boomers line up in the hallways of American elementary schools. You don't know if you're sucking the sugar cube or the sugar cure. But you get a card that says you are a proud and brave polio pioneer. My cousin Bobby was not so lucky. His polio didn't get cured and he suffered. But lucky Mitch McConnell overcame at the rehab founded by the Democratic President 32. Now he insists on policies that paralyze health care and fair weather friend to his wealthy friends and in secret inside his turtle shell he hurts millions. He turns away associations like American Heart, American Lung, American Diabetes, even the March of Dimes. No degree of separation which saved him from disability. You, you shameful Mitch McConnell. There is a special place in hell, which has been, hell has been mentioned several times tonight. But what separates us from Mitch is 88 billionaire degrees of hellfire. So Mitch McConnell, despite whatever you did, this, the, the other day. So we'll go on to something else. Okay, that's enough of the rant on that. So, um, I think a lot of people know that uh, 50 years ago was the summer of love. What were you doing? I hate this thing. Oh, Jesus. Okay, well, the summer of love. You know, we wanted it all, so we wanted our careers, and we wanted romance, and all that good stuff that went with it. So, um, working hard for that paycheck, I never seem to get a rest. I'm working hard for that paycheck, I never seem to get a rest. But when I'm lying in your arms, oh, that's the time I love the best. So come a little closer, see what these luscious lips can do. I say come a little closer, see what these luscious lips can do. I ain't never had a mama who could do a thing or two with you. So um, let's just talk, let's just stay in that vein for a little minute. This is called Honey Locust. Early summer, honey locust blossoms from the tall, stately tree, an aphrodisiac to me, like the Kama Sutra, entangled glyphs on ancient temple walls, like ambrosia of the Greco-Roman gods, like pharaohs given baths by pole-eyed girls, like Persian miniature, like furtive looks and hookah bars, like aromatics from hole-in-the-wall shops in the village, or bazaars where you fumbled with unfamiliar currency, like an aura of perfume that encircles a woman, like her tapestried sari as she breezes through customs, like incense sticks you bought in head shops when your head was smaller and less stuck with responsible thoughts, like teenage memories of exotic world's fair pavilions, like a silk scarf that lines a drawer where you spilled a bottle of patchouli that time, like the powder applied with a fine feathered brush, 
like the henna hair and the senna leaf tea you tried when you lived in the mountains by the sea, like the secret musk of sheets after lovemaking. Come outside. Come smell the honey locust with me, the tree so tall, its bark with deep creviced mysteries, the blossoms so far up stretch higher and higher till you catch a whiff, the blossoms falling like gentle white rain, ephemeral, caressing your face. I've waited all year for this day of the honey locust bloom. In misty rain, in sun and darkness, I've waited patiently. Make a pallet on the ground, line our bed with its blossoms. Now. Yeah. else. The aphrodisiac itself is a feminine. Weekender. Weekender. That's what it said on the box. Essential oils, aromatic, teasing feather brush, lay flightless in a Victorian secret treasure chest amid brown balsam needles. Thirty winters of prickly weekends laying end to end how long did that moldy box languish at the very bottom of my cerebral closet after our flesh no longer burned and we were blind to what we had become? Yeah. So going back way before the summer of love, <laughs> it was hotter than a two-peckered goat, hot enough to fry an egg on the pavement, so hot that cicadas with their incessant buzzing wish they would go back into the cold, dark ground, hot enough to wear your bathing suit around the neighborhood in search of a little round rubber pool, in search of a lawn sprinkler. When mothers didn't drive and fathers commuted in Chevys without air conditioning, without Bluetooth, it was before. FM radio, for Christ's sake. But we managed to have fun right there in our little paradise with block parties, eating hot dogs, riding bikes, and eating ice cream, letting chocolatey goodness run down our chins, sucking from the hole on the bottom of a sugar cone. We'd line up at the good humor truck with our dimes and quarters. Tony was the tallest. She was older. She was beautiful. She already had breasts bigger than mosquito bites. I'd seen her pinkish brown nipples when we changed into our suits. Her mother was beautiful too, but she had a temper. She would arch her black curved eyebrows. She would yell till her voice got all high pitched. She was from Greece. She looked like that opera singer Maria Callas and like her she'd be calm and controlled one minute and then fly off to the key of crazy. That summer, Grandma Agnes came to visit. She was old, but she'd been beautiful, too. She was hard to understand as she stood on the front stoop and yelled at us to be careful, dry off, come in, eat baklava, or go home to your own house. She always stood in the same spot on the front stoop in her plain black dress with the cap sleeves, the dress all Greek matrons wear in Crete, in Athens, women in black dresses sitting in sun-drenched, whitewashed houses in Santorini, in Mykonos. I always wondered how she could keep cool in that black dress, and then Tony told me her secret, but I had to see for myself, so I took some chalk and drew hopscotch lines on the concrete stoop right where Grandma Agnes's spot was, and when she came out to yell at us, I crouched way down so I could look up that black dress, and sure enough, what Tony said was true. Her underpants weren't black lace, they weren't white cotton, they weren't blue and white like the Greek flag, but there was something I could not forget. So now, when the mercury nears 100 and the cicadas are buzzing and the ice cream truck comes around, I think of Agnes, long dead. I wear my little black sundress, and I follow her tradition. I wear Agnes's underpants, the kind that let the breezes of the fair Aegean waft through, and that is to say, none at all. <laughs>